Welcome to Sunday worship here at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. Now there's a whole bunch of things going on this Sunday. The time has changed. Halloween didn't quite happen last night and there's a US election right around the corner. Any of those things are enough to make a person feel out of sorts. But no matter how you're feeling, we gather here on Sunday morning to place our feet firmly once more um, in our faith in Jesus Christ. We come here to abide. And so let those things kind of fade into the background for just a couple moments and let us focus our hearts, our minds, and our bodies upon Christ as we worship. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen all the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory Let us 
just experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory long for to be overcome by your presence Lord let me share with you some announcements from the life of this church we are uh, grateful for technology we're grateful for YouTube the ways that we've been able to connect um, in this kind of crazy time but at the same time, we're also trying to find new ways to be together, ways that almost are, are more, more reminiscent of, of ways we used to be. And so this Sunday is Communion Sunday. So here's a good time for you to kind of pause the video and to go and get communion elements if, uh, for later on in the service. But, but I also want to give you an alternative to communion online. Uh, this Sunday from 11 a.m. till noon, I'll be serving communion here at the church for anybody who wants to come drive by and, um, and receive communion in your car. Uh, communion elements are going to be safe. I have a, uh, they're like prepackaged. Um, I'll have them in a little plastic bag, uh, completely safe. They'll be wearing masks, gloves, the whole nine yards, 11 o'clock till noon this Sunday. Come on by. Remember the time change, but, but come on by and um, I'd be glad to serve you communion and, uh, and pray with you. Uh, it is also November. And so Thanksgiving and Christmas are right around the corner. This is the time of year where we're usually kind of, kind of hustling and trying to prepare ourselves for the holidays. But we know this year that the holidays will be different. And many of the things that we used to do to, to mark the holidays are not going to be possible. So, so in some ways, what I'd like us to do is begin to kind of prepare ourselves for that. So, it, so we don't have a holiday season that's, that's driven by, by disappointment or by depression or by the things that are lost. So I want to invite you uh, this season to begin to, to reframe the holidays with me. Now, we're going to try to create some new practices, practices that, that kind of are, are harkening back to the things that we used to be able to do but aren't able to do now, but, but things that we can do anew in this new situation, things that uh, our hope is that will focus us on, on the true meaning of the season so we can begin to see Jesus Christ, where he is, where he's alive and where he is moving here in the now. We want to see Christmas with, with fresh eyes. So let me, let me give you a few ideas of, of things that we're, we're thinking about. This Sunday, we're doing a drive-in or drive-through communion. We'll do that again in December. Uh, on over November 15th and 22nd, we're going to do a food drive. And what I want you to think about is I want you to think about all the food that you purchased um, in the worst-case scenario aspect of this quarantining uh, and the things that are kind of, kind of all pushed to the back of your cabinet, dry beans, dry rice, those kind of things. I want you to um, grab those things, come by the church and drop them off to us and we will redistribute them to uh, food ministries, local food ministries. And when you do that, we have a gift for you. We, um, we want to give you a, a Christmas wreath. I'll, I'll show it to you here. It's, in essence, what we're trying to do, um, we would love to put one of these in every single house in the church. And what we'd, we'd love to do is, um, is kind of create new religious practices, uh, new ways of, of taking what we've always done here in the sanctuary together and be able to allow you to do it in your home. And so when we have uh, Advent worship, we'll have a time where we're lighting the candles and remembering and thinking through different things. And you'll be able to light a candle uh, at, your, at your home as well. So in some ways, we're hoping to kind of start some, some new practices uh, for helping us to remember, helping us to worship, help us to be present to Advent. Uh, we're also going to be doing a Christmas gift drive by allowing you to donate a gift to, to Angel Tree Ministries. There'll be uh, people there to give you uh, opportunities to, to do so on November 15th and 22nd when you drive by the church to get your wreath and to drop off your food for the food drive. Uh, we're also planning on putting a Christmas tree out in the front lawn of the church that we're going to call our prayer tree. It's going to give people an opportunity to come by the church, um, even if there's people walking by the church, and write prayers and hang them on the branches of, of the Christmas tree. Another way just to, to kind of um, be able to worship in presence and in person um, in, in a new way. We're, 
we're still thinking through other things we can do on Christmas Eve and things that we can do for, for caroling in ways that honor Christ, that give space to us to rejoice and to, uh, to touch the ways that we've always celebrated together. But, but in some ways I'm asking you, let's, um, let's begin in this time to, to begin to reframe the holiday seasons and think what is the best way we as a, as a community of faith, we as individual Christians can, can honor Christ during Thanksgiving, during Christmas, during Advent. Uh, finally, I want to thank all of you for your generosity, the ways that you've been giving to us. And I want to ask you to continue to give as you're able. Um, and again, in this time period, if you can think uh, particularly in terms of uh, any end of year giving you might be doing, please remember the church in that time period. Uh, we, are, we are blessed by your giving. We are dependent upon your giving. And you can give in one of two ways. There's a, a link to the website that's on the screen right now, or uh, you can mail a check directly to the church. Uh, but thank you for um, the ways that you give and the ways that you, you walk with us as your church community. Uh, now I'd like to invite Calvin to lead us in a time of prayer. Hey church, thanks for tuning in today. I'm glad you're all here with us, praying and worshiping together. Would you please now join me in coming before the Lord in prayer? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, God, our King, Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you now. We look for your comfort. We look for your peace. We look for wisdom. We look for guidance, God, in a time of chaos, Lord. With Halloween just around the corner, another potentially very polarizing day, subject, topic in the Christendom world, God. Let us remember that. However people are spending that day, wherever your people are doing whatever thing, that there's never a time to not be asking what it is that you want, Lord, for this day, what it is that you want for us in these hours, in these minutes. Lord, let it, there's never an excuse not to be putting our decisions before you. There's never a reason we shouldn't be considering what your thoughts are, what your heart is towards everything in our lives, Lord. I pray that we, as your Christian people, would represent something different from the times, God, that we would shine joyfully. God, I ask for big hearts for us, God what it means to be people of sacrifice, what it means to be people who forego because we have a savior who sacrificed and forewent, Lord. What does it mean to have compassion for people in this time? What does it mean to love people well in this time? And the political tension, the global tension, the social tension, the emotional tension. Lord, let us be reaching out to you. Let us be beacons of hope. Let us be oasis, Lord, in a desert, in a chaotic wilderness. God, let us reflect that. Let us witness to people and the, the, the only way we can truly do that is being grounded in the ways and the person of Jesus Christ in his demeanors and his attitudes towards others, in his patience, in his inspiration and endeavoring towards God's kingdom and being close to the Father. Lord, help us to pursue that. Always. Guide our steps, Lord. Help us to pray. And to pray from our hearts, not just from our heads. To pray in the way that Jesus taught us, but really feeling into those words that he's given us. Lord, and we pray that by saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Atmosphere is changing now. For well, the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. Spirit of the Lord is He. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is He. Overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with Your love. Your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. The atmosphere is changing now, for the spirit of the is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here overflow in this place fill our hearts with your love your love surrounds us you're the reason we came to encounter your love surrounds us. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love. Your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love. Your shown us we need your presence your kingdom come your will be done here as in heaven spirit of God fall fresh on us we need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, 
for fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in Will you please pray with me? Jesus, we ask that you would bless this moment. We ask that you would, would hallow it by your presence, your presence, um, God, in every single living room, in every single heart, in every single way, drawing us deeper to yourself. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna begin by reading a scripture passage to you that was something of a reality check to me um, at some point in my life. This is from the prophet Jeremiah, God speaking in uh, Jeremiah 17, verses nine and 10. It says, the heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Now, this, um, this text was something of a reality check to me at some point in my life because I, I fell rather easily into the mindset of as long as you follow your heart, you're going to be okay. And this verse argues otherwise. In fact, it argues that not only are our hearts not infallible guides, but but we don't always know what's going on deep within ourselves. Our hearts can, can even deceive us. You see, only God understands the heart. Only God really understands our, our true motivations, our true desires, or the, and the wounds within a person. Now, if you take these two verses and you kind of apply it to ourselves, if we apply it to ourselves, we realize that, that we don't even really know the depths of ourselves. But the moment we start walking with Jesus, we, we begin to allow him to kind of peel back the layers of our hearts and and help us to understand, help us understand why we get so angry, why we feel so bitter, why we feel so insecure or hurt or, or like controlling things or vulnerable or afraid. And, and God peels the layers back and begins to heal our hearts. Now, when we take these verses and we apply them to other people, we begin to understand why scripture kind of over and over again, again says to us, don't judge other people. I mean, how does the quote go? It says, uh, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. If we, if we sit in these verses long enough, we begin to understand that our greatest calling, our greatest role in life is not to judge other people, but maybe it's to, to bring them into a place where they get to know God, where we, we speak the gospel to them in this ministry of reconciliation, where we, where we begin to introduce people who have broken hearts to the one, the only one who is able to heal their hearts. Now, if you think about it, judging people is, um, it's too layered for us. It's too layered. People are too layered for us to, to judge them. Uh, we're limited in our ability to understand, to understand people's motives, to understand uh, people's reactions or their triggers or, or the reasons for thinking the way that we do, the way that they do, which can make getting along pretty tricky, even in the church. Let me tell you a story. One of the uh, very first ministry gigs I ever had was in youth ministry in a, in a totally different church. And I was pretty young. I was still in seminary. I was kind of full of spit and fire and um, maybe a little naive at times. Uh, one of the things that I often did in my life, um, probably from after high school on, is, is I would get together with friends late at night and we'd hang out together and we'd talk and, and we'd smoke cigars together. Now, um, I still was doing this at this point. It was one of the ways that I would, I would connect with my seminary friends and we would kind of be able to think and talk deeply into each other's lives. And, and um, it was so important to me that in some ways you could tell by um, the fact that when I got married, the gift that I gave to my groomsmen was uh, really nice cigars as a way of saying thank you for being part of my wedding, part of my life. 
But one of my, my working mistakes at this point of my life is that I, that I let the youth group that I was working with at the time know about all of this. And, and one student in particular kept hounding me. He wanted to, to hang out and he wanted to smoke cigars with me. And I, and I told him he wasn't 18 yet, which I think is the time period where you're allowed to do that or not, according to the government. Um, but I said, when you turn 18, we'll think about it. Maybe we'll sit down and smoke cigars together. I was kind of in some ways kind of pushing him off, thinking that's years away. A, he'll never remember. And B, future Andrew will have an excuse by then. But future Andrew, which is now past Andrew, didn't have an excuse. And so when this um, particular youth um, went to college, he ended up coming back for fall break. He had just turned 18 and he came back with two cigars. And he came back with two really, really nice cigars. And he said, all right, let's go hang out and and we did, and we hung out and we talked and um, I was able to kind of speak Christ into his life, find out how college was going and encourage him. And, and we smoked cigars together. It was, it was all good. At least it was all good from my perspective in what some might consider another rookie move. This, um, this student of mine told his mom that we had gotten together and smoked cigars together and his mom had gone ballistic. In fact, he, um, he called me and said, hey, Andrew, I just give you a little word of advice. I would avoid my mom for the next couple of weeks at church if you're able to. And then he, he went back to college. Now, I reviewed the tape in my mind of everything that happened. And, and I didn't think that I had done anything wrong. I mean, the kid was old enough to buy cigars by himself. The government was okay with him smoking cigars. Didn't she know the things that his friends smoked in college? I mean, is there something that I, I was missing in the Bible that said that cigars are something you're not supposed to do? Why was she so upset with me? Now, the thing that really kind of hurt me the most was the fact that I, I considered this, um, this student of mine, I would consider his mother a friend of mine. And, and I knew he was right. I knew she was upset. And I, and I knew that I needed to apologize, but I just, I wasn't really sure what I would be apologizing for. I actually disagreed with her that this was even a thing. Now, if you listen to that story and you're on the other side of the cigar thing for me, that's totally fine. In fact, that's a good thing with what I want to do with this story going forward tonight or today. Um, you see, I share this story with you because, because I want to talk about the times where we don't agree. I want to talk about the times where we, we, don't, we don't see things the same way, the times when we, we conflict and, and what are we supposed to do about it? In particular, I want to talk about the times where Christians or, or church people, when they conflict. Because the thing about church people is that when we, when we disagree, we tend to disagree pretty hard. There's this, this, um, this seemingly like ecclesial transitive property that seems to say that if we disagree about this one thing, then there's a pretty good chance that, that one of us doesn't really know who Jesus is in the first place. I mean, who can, who can you trust that smokes a cigar to tell you about Jesus? Am I, am I right? But I want to talk to you why I think it's important that, that cigar smoking Christians and non-cigar smoking Christians actually get along. And hopefully at some point you begin to see through this illustration and begin to understand the, um, or see the greater disagreements we church people seem to be having with one another in our, in our present cultural and political moment. But we're in the middle of a sermon series, a sermon series on reconciliation. And, and in some ways I'm beginning to think that maybe the very core of what Jesus was about was reconciliation. It was, it was how he healed hearts. It's how he healed our hearts in relationship with God. It's how he, he healed our hearts in relationship with one another. It's how he healed our hearts in relationship with ourselves. In many ways, it's how he calls us to approach a world that needs his healing. We've called this sermon series, um, or we've titled it Open Arms, because in, in some ways we, we have this metaphor that we're trying to use for reconciliation that's, a, that's kind of a, a precursor to or part of an embrace Instead of a posture of defensiveness or, or judgmentalism towards each other, we're, we're to have a posture that is, that is ready and open to embrace one another, that, that reconciliation is open arms. So the difficulty of this metaphor is that it's called for even when we don't agree. In some ways, it's, that's actually when the metaphor is the most important. That's, that's how we bring reconciliation into a world that's divided. Now, why would we do this? Well, we do this because Jesus did it first. We do this because it is with open arms and reconciliation. That's the way that Jesus conquered the world. It's with open arms and reconciliation that Jesus is continuing to conquer the world through us. And I think it's particularly important for us, if we kind of step back even further from this, that the Christians learn to, to disagree and be together. You see, when the church is able to be reconciled, even its indifferences, in its differences, it, 
it almost announces to the powers and the principalities of the world that, that, that something is going on here that's bigger than them, something that's bigger than the, the ability to destroy and to break people apart, that there's something going on here that is, that is greater than they. You see, our unity, not to be confused with our, our sameness, it's our testimony to Christ's embrace. Now, I wanna spend most of our time this morning together in um, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. You see, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, they didn't have cigar smokers and non-cigar smokers, but they did have a lot of disagreements or differences of opinion on how to be Christians. And, and the biggest problem they had was that was the early Christian church in Rome was, was how do you translate Jesus's Jewishness to a group of people who didn't grow up Jewish? And when I say Jewish, I'm not talking about Jesus' ethnic, ethnic Jewishness, but his, his religious Jewishness. Because you see, somebody who, who, grew up, um, who grew up Jewish is gonna have a lot of rules that he knows he's gotta follow in order to be put in a place where, where he can be in the presence of God, where he can be ritualistically clean, where he can worship. And, and Jesus followed all of those rules. But there were several places where Jesus spoke where it seemed like those rules might not be all that important anymore. So, so which is it? Is, was part of being a Christian following these rules or not? And the proverbial rubber kind of hit the road when it came to eating meat. Because see, in Rome, uh, you'd go to the market to buy meat and there's a good chance that the meat you bought at the market was actually originally from a pagan temple and used as a sacrifice because they would sacrifice meat and they'd sell it to the market, which would then sell it to the public. Um, and, and if you could get past that, the fact that the meat that you're eating may have been used in a pagan ritual, well, then there was also this reality that in order to have meat that was clean or, or, or ritualistically clean, it needed to be to be drained of all of its fluids, drained of all of its blood. And so it had to be butchered in a very particular way. And so, so anytime a person went to the market, they couldn't be sure that, that, the, that the meat was, was drained properly, was taken care of properly, that it was actually butchered correctly. So in the Roman church, what you ended up having is you had a bunch of people who believed that Jesus said, it's okay to eat the meat no matter what. And you had a bunch of people who were, who were scandalized at the very idea of eating meat. And these two groups, they, they judged each other. They, um, they questioned if the other group even knew Jesus. They would they'd get together late at night and smoke cigars together and debate whether or not, it, okay, that part probably didn't happen. But, but the apostle Paul knew this was a big problem. And so in his letter to the church in Rome, he, um, he weighs in on it. But he weighs in not by telling one side they're right and the other side is wrong. He does it by giving them three lenses, three lenses with which he wanted them to look at their disagreements. And these lenses are found in Romans chapter 14 and 15. So, so I wanna look at these lenses and what I want us to do is kind of practice putting these lenses on by, by looking at my, my cigar smoking fiasco from 20 years ago. Look with me at the first lens. This is from uh, Romans chapter 14, verses one through four. Paul writes, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgments on the servants of another? It is before their own Lord, they stand or fall and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, ultimately, Paul defines this conflict as, as something of a, um, a thing that people are able to differ on. The, the old time churchy word for this is adiaphora. Something is adiaphora if it's not, if it's not salvific. So, so Paul was essentially saying, you know, you can really believe either way on this. And I think Jesus is okay either way. And that probably would have been a good place for the apostle Paul to kind of close it up and just kind of step away from this problem. But, but he knew that if he left it there, there would still be two groups within the church who were kind of constantly bickering about which way was better, even if both were acceptable. And so the first lens he gives to church is this. He says, do not judge one another. He says, do not despise someone else for thinking differently. And I think there's, there's two things that the apostle Paul was trying to get across here. The first is that it's important to give space to other people so they may grow in their faith. If, if, if eating vegetables is the weaker position, which the apostle Paul believed, well, then those who are stronger needed to use their strength in order to, to bless the weaker individual. They had to, to give room for the other person to maybe grow into stronger faith or at least allow them to, to stand in the same way that they're called to stand. Because the, the truth is that, that God has welcomed them, that God has welcomed them as they are into his presence. And who are we to do otherwise? The second thing that seemed important to Paul here is that it was important to realize that, that no one actually stands by getting all of the, uh, the places they're standing right. 
Nobody stands because their positions on things are, are perfect. We stand because God allows us to stand. We, we stand because it was God upholds us. So, so what he's essentially saying is, as you humbly allow God to uphold you, so do the same for those who disagree with you. Now, if we take this and we apply it to my cigar smoking story, it's, it's obvious to me that being upset about smoking cigars 20 years ago was the weaker faith position. And I'm only kind of half kidding about that because the truth is every time we bring an argument into this text, we tend to think of ourselves as the stronger faith position. And, and that's actually okay because in some ways that puts the onus upon us to, to understand the other person, to, to begin to empathize, to be able to step into their shoes, to welcome them as they are into fellowship with us. So instead of despising my student's mother for judging me, which was what I was pretty sure she was doing, I tried to step back to understand her. Regardless of whether cigars were legal or not, whether they were right or wrong, or whether Jesus would ever come back and smoke a cigar with me late at night, which is what I kind of hoped he would do someday, she didn't like them. More than that, she didn't like the idea that her son was smoking a cigar. And, and that was valid. Not only was that valid, that was, that was worth honoring. So in a way, the point was that, that, that the point was not the right or the wrong of the situation. The point was more of the relationship and maybe even more specifically staying in relationship rather than letting our disagreements divide us. Uh, let's slide forward a little more in our text. I want you to look at the second lens, the second lens the Apostle Paul gives us for looking at how we should view um, our conflicts and our differences. This is from Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. He says, let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing in it is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of, for one, and of one for whom Christ died. Now, I don't know if you can see it here, but what, G, what Paul's essentially doing is he, he's spinning our perspective. See, when we typically walk into an argument or a debate or a, or a fight or a conflict, we, we do so by thinking about ourselves, which is, again, not bad. That's just what we do. But we think from the perspective of us. I didn't do anything wrong. That was my first, my second, and my third thought after I found out that my, my student's mother was mad at me for the cigar smoking incident. But, but what the Apostle Paul is doing is here is he's, he's asking us to put on a lens that shifts our opinion. Instead of thinking about what we think, what we feel, what we think is right or wrong or our reasoning behind something, he asks us to think about the other person's good instead. You see, it isn't enough just to not judge. We need to be about their good. Even if I'm convinced, and I think I still am, that cigars are fine, if I know that the other person thinks that cigars are terrible, I need to realize that for them, they are terrible. And if in their believing that they're terrible, they are attempting to not smoke cigars as a way of honoring God because their body is a temple and they're trying to, trying to keep it for God, then, then I need to support them in their effort to honor God. You see, my freedom to smoke a cigar is not worth getting in someone else's way in their faith. Let me give you a better, uh, time, more timely illustration. One of the things we're trying to do here at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church is, is figure out how to have in-person worship again. And that's not easy to do. And, and this is probably a good parenthetical place to also say we've been, we've been trying to live stream those as well and not doing that all that well. So we want to apologize and, and give you... Um, encourage you to kind of stick with us because I think it's important that we are together, whether on live stream or in person and, and just be graceful with us. But with that said, in order to have people in person on church campus again, there's a whole bunch of volunteers needed. There's a lot of rules and things that we have to take care of from the government's perspective. And we just need, we just need people who are willing to help and willing to serve. And, and the deacons of the church have largely stepped into that role of service. And, and I want to brag about them in general for a second, but I also want to brag about one deacon in particular. You see, one of the deacons, they don't, they're not a fan of wearing masks. And whether you agree with that or not, in some ways, isn't the point. So if you, and immediately an argument res, rests up inside of you, I want you to kind of push that aside for a minute because what matters is that, is not what he believes about it, but what matters is that he chooses to put a mask on every single time he walks out the door. What matters is that he chooses to put a mask on every single time he comes to the church to do anything and not because he thinks it's necessary, but because he's choosing to love the people who do. Do you get it? 
He places his own perspective on hold in order to love us. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Much better illustration than stinky old cigars. Let me read to you the last lens that the Apostle Paul gives us. This is from Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read the first two verses. He says, We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. So the Apostle Paul here is kind of driving home that kind of flipped perspective. He's, he's saying that our ultimate goal needs to be reconciliation. And it, and it actually needs to be about the reconciliation of the other person with Jesus Christ, that that needs to be our priority. So I need to treat my, um, my student's mother in a way that I prioritize her being built up in Jesus Christ. And, and I also have to realize that her being built up in Jesus Christ has nothing to do with what she thinks about cigars. So with this lens, I, I, it quickly became apparent to me that I, that I needed to call and apologize. Not because I thought she was right or I was wrong, but I needed to apologize because I valued her. I needed to apologize to let her know that, um, or to make sure that I didn't put a stumbling block in front of her in her faith and, and to let her know that the most important thing to me was actually building her up in her relationship with Jesus, building her up in her relationship with the church. And the beautiful thing about this story is that this woman is a, she's a dynamic Christian. And then when I end up calling her with my, my apology phone call, I, I felt like I was being built up in my own relationship with God. It became very apparent to me that that was what was most important to her too. And I have to tell you, it, it felt really good to be blessed like that. Look, I know that voting happens this Tuesday. I know that the political fault lines of our country are, are pretty deep. And I know that those political fault lines, they, they run directly through the Christian church. They run directly through Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. I, I know that our country is incredibly divided at this moment. But we are of Christ. We are called by Christ to have open arms. We are called to be different, to feel differently, to, to vote differently by voting to honor God whichever way you vote. We are we are called to live reconciliation, to have our arms open wide, in particular for those who vote differently from us. The Apostle Paul says, do not judge. He says, be concerned for them as your priority. Allow, allow nothing that you do be, to become a stumbling block for them. That they are, Make sure that, that your priority is that they're, they're built up in their relationship with Jesus Christ in their relationship with the church. And trust God. Trust God to hold on to us. Trust God to hold on to them. Trust God to hold on to all of us. And begin to realize that this is, um, this is how Jesus Christ embraces each of us as we, as we kind of rumble, stumble, and bumble on this path of faith. Will you please pray with me? Jesus, whatever happens on Tuesday, whatever happens on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever happens in the future, Lord, we want to be identified with you. We want to be people who walk into whatever happens in ways that honor you, that glorify you. We want to be people who, who know how to love one another, even in our differences. Lord, we want to be ministers of reconciliation. We ask that you would, even now, open our eyes that we may see. Even now, we ask, Lord, that you would show us how to have open arms. We pray that in Christ's holy name. Amen.
So if you haven't done so already, now is a good time to pause the video and get elements for communion for you and your family or whoever is with you. Any, any bread, any cracker, any juice will do. Again, it's, it's more about the presence of Christ and the, the practice than it is about the brand name on the elements. So let us gather here together. Gather here together at the table of the Lord. Here at the Lord's table is where, is where God upholds us upholds us in what he has done and the grace that he has poured out for us and what the ways he has borne for us. So, so come to the table, come to the table, not to, to prove yourself, not to show yourself, but to, to allow yourself to be upheld by the living God. You see the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me and take the bread and break it at home. And as you break the bread, allow Christ to bear upon himself the things that weigh you down. So take your anxiety, take your fear, take your sins, take your brokenness and say, Jesus, um, I place this on this bread. I place this upon your shoulders because you've told me that you will, that you will bear these things for me. And so take these things and, and place them on Christ and say, say, Jesus, I confess them to you. I give them to you. And then let us take in remembrance of him. So in the same manner, Christ took the cup, saying, this cup is, is my covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And so take the cup from home. This cup represents the, the life of Christ poured out in you, the life of Christ that, that fills you, the life of Christ that is life without end, that is given to you. This is, this is Christ not only upholding the things that are broken in you, but making you anew. So as you are ready, take the cup and, and, and partake. And understand that when we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And you are the people of God. So go therefore in peace. Go in peace knowing that, that God goes with you. He upholds you. He, he walks with you and he also walks with the others that are on the path. And so walk with your arms wide open ready to reconcile as Christ has reconciled all things in you. Go in that peace. Amen.